Oh, hello there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. And this is episode number 332. That's 332. How are you feeling? How are you doing? Great. Amazing. How am I? Same as always, man. Same as always. Nothing ever changes around here. Enough. I'm sure the same thing is going on with you guys, wherever you may be, right? I'm sure the same thing is happening wherever you are, wherever you're watching this, wherever you're listening to this, you are going through that Groundhog Day thing where every day seems to blend into the other and there seems to be no end in sight. But I'm here to provide you some level of entertainment. If it's your first time listening to the show, then you know what to do. Smash that like button, hit subscribe, and leave me a comment down below. If you listen to the podcast app, of course, leave me a five-star review and share it with your friends. That would go a long way in order to help spread it, get me some coins in my pocket so I can make sure I don't go back to employment once everything is over. All right? Thanks. Great. Amazing. Oh, man. Man, oh, man, oh, man. Um, we won't talk about football because obviously, you know, I don't care about football right now. I'm going to ignore everything that has to do with everything that's nothing to do with May United will get ignored for the next two weeks or maybe a month. So, you know, you can miss me with all that. You know, it was good for it's good for the Premier League. <laughs> so, fuck off. Right. I, I believe in rivalries. I believe in. Um, uh, yeah, I believe in rivalries. I believe in just not caring about any other team that's not the team you're supporting. I'm not a Team GB guy. I don't care about all that nonsense. I think it's propaganda that's spewed out by Sky Sports and TalkSport to make us, what, um, some sort of uh, flaky copy of the American sports culture. No thanks. I don't have a second or third team. I have only one team. One team is in my heart. One team that I bleed, that's red, that's united. Everything else, you can stick it up your wazoo. Anyway, apart from that, what else has I been doing? Um, what else has been going on? Many things, isn't it? Um, news has kind of really broken out at the moment that, you know, Texas is going to go back under, back into lockdown. They reopened, you know, they had a bit of a soft reopening. And then, um, which basically came at the behest of protesters, you remember? Those protesters on the street shouting and raving about um, the state needs to reopen and it was trampling on their Second Amendment rights or whatever it may be. And now they're in a position where the cases are spiking super hard in the States. I wonder why that happened, though, because there was a period in time when everyone, um, I don't know, from Florida to Texas wasn't really abiding by the lockdown rules and social distancing and wearing the face mask. They just were doing what they were doing. And everyone kept saying, oh, watch, it's going to spike, it's going to spike. And it never did. Then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, it started to spike. I wonder why that, why that was. Um, I don't know. Maybe it's a consequence of the protest. Maybe, maybe not. Who actually knows? But to get the show started, I thought the best way to actually get the show started and actually talk about some very interesting topics that I want to speak about. I'm going to actually get rid of some of these windows because I don't think they're going to be beneficial. And my computer's crying. Google Chrome is such a disaster, isn't it? Let's get rid of that as well. Um, let's open up the show with this amazing video that I saw um, actually uh, shared video social media. I think it's a good way to kind of prime us in terms of getting us a an understanding of what's currently going on in the world at the moment so here it goes listen to what the gen z's are doing and how well they're handling the situation so let's lower the sound a little bit and let's play that bad boy get onto full screen and then bish we show up in t-shirts and holding signs but the officers and military are showing up locked and loaded with bulletproof shields to protect them against what paper cuts um, I did not come here to speak, but after hearing what Karen here behind me said, I needed to... I love this girl. I'm not sure if the girl behind, the woman behind her is a Karen, but I like this slight like this before you get started, right? It's amazing. Speak up. Um, she's upset because her officer husband is being cussed at and supposedly followed and spit on, but I just want to point out that people who are black have had to endure all of that and brutality at the hands of the people who are supposed to protect them for over 400 years, which is why we are here to protest in the first place. You're not watching me right now. I know if you're listening via the podcast, but I'm kneeling right now. I'm kneeling. This is the first knee I've taken this entire process. I've got my white ally here, right? I've got Cindy or Rebecca, whatever her name is. She's holding it down for us. You know what I mean? So I am sorry that in the last 10 days you have felt just a little bit uncomfy, but I hope that you can understand that you've now had a fraction of a taste of it. And if you've got any empathy in that little blue heart of yours, then I suggest that you start looking at this from the other side, the morally, legally, and ethically correct side. It is not a blue life. It is a fucking blue shirt. Another Karen earlier. 
another Karen earlier said if someone broke the law, then they should be arrested. Okay, so then let, let's arrest the police who said screw everything that they learned in their supposed max of six months of training, and let's arrest the police who turn off their cameras. Let's arrest the police who use violence against people on the opposing side just to prove an invalid made-up point. Woo. If someone broke the law, they should be arrested. So let's arrest them. Someone here said that we are not against you. We just want you to do what you swore to do, which is protect and serve. So why are we protecting ourselves against you? If you are more concerned about protecting property rather than law-abiding citizens, then you are the problem. We show up in t-shirts and holding signs, but the officers and military are showing up locked and loaded with bulletproof shields to protect them against what? Paper cuts? After a ma probable maximum of six months of training, you can't handle someone yelling facts in your face? At this point, the opposers know what the right decision is. Karen, you were not at the protest. We were. We saw what happened with our own eyes. You watched the news. That is the difference. <laughs> we are speaking on experience, and you are speaking out of willful ignorance. But enough about her. I am really here to tell all of you to vote yes, because the wall behind you says, let honor, truth, and justice rule within these walls. And I hope that you abide by that. Thank you. Absolute fire. She came through and just... <sighs> Torch that room, bro. Give me goosebumps, man. Gen Zs are amazing, innit? People give them a bad rap, right? But god damn it, man. They sabotage um, Trump's rally in Tulsa. Um, they resurrected Jason Derulo's career, right? They, at some point, I remember there was a group of, of Gen Z teenagers that were catching child predators and shit. Like, these kids are amazing, man. They're out there putting their lives on the line, getting pepper sprayed every single day, getting beaten up with batons by men that could be their fathers or grandfathers. They're putting their lives on the line for real. Look what they're doing, man. Look what they're doing. God damn it, man. You go, girl. So I thought that was amazing to see, really. Honestly, really, really inspiring. And I think it's... Um, I think it's just comforting because I think my generation, millennials group, we got a bit disenfranchised, isn't it? We probably have to go through what? The Afghanistan war, the whole weapon of mass destruction, Brexit. There were so many things, um, even just the um, university tuition fiasco, right? There's so many things that kind of made us get, I don't know, what we, we just we just felt as if like our voice would not be heard, right, within the political circle. So we just decided, F that, let's just move on and not bother voting. But I like that these kids coming up have a little bit more optimism than we do. They they're they're ready to bring the fight um to the establishments, to the state, to their Congress, to whatever it may be, right? Um, they're ready to actually put their lives on the line, they're ready to actually be, you know, protesting on the streets. Some of them are a bit loopy, right? Especially the ones that have short hair and it's all coloured and stuff and they get into weird gender politics stuff. But for the most part, they know what they're doing, man. They know what they're doing. And again, I can't um I can't begrudge it. And I'm a big fan of actually allowing kids that actually want to take part in these things and want to voice their opinions and want to enact change the room to do so. I think forcing everybody to take some kind of stance or say some sort of comment is just unfair because some people just don't have the mental um, or intellectual bandwidth to do so. And it's not a slight on them. It's not saying, oh, they're dumb, right? They're just not proficient in, in that one area. It's sort of like talking to, about football to girls. Most of the time, they don't have a clue what you're talking about. And they could give... They don't have a clue and they could really care less. It's that kind of combination, right? It's like, I don't care and don't tell me, <laughs> right? Um, so it's not as if like they're dumb because she doesn't know what the offside rule is, right? She just doesn't care. She doesn't want to know because it's not going to benefit in any way, shape or form. So I think politics is the same sort of way uh, or social justice issues are the same sort of thing too. You should allow the people who are proficient, who are experts and who have a passion for it to uh, say any act of change they want. And then if they need help from us, you know, to kind of band around them, to be allies or to hold stuff off or to make signs or whatever, or to lift boxes, I'm there for you. But I'm not gonna be on there in the street politics because like, it's not my place do you know what i mean the place is for this generation to take us down so yeah big up her man amazing to see that really really great way to open the show i think because it put me in a good mood anyway at least so hopefully you guys are in a good mood um what's next on the list here Bupity, 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 oh this is another one uh no 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 this is um a kind of a roughly uh just an observation on what's happening within fashion um and just generally a, the state of Mm, let's see, yeah, the state of fashion or just generally the um, what do they call it what's the word there's a word for it right when you just um when nothing impresses you you're just a little bit you know you're always in a constant 
uh, state of wanting to be impressed. And I guess fashion people have always had that kind of reputation, right? They were kind of stuck up and have their nose in the air um, continuously. Nothing impresses them apart from, you know, he- um, old school helmet lang or whatever it may be. There's, there's, there's a certain thing about it. And you're seeing it raise its ugly head with the news that Matthew Williams was, you know, um, was granted the position as artistic director or creative director for Givenchy. He's um, lucky enough to have the position for both men's and women's, which is going to be awesome to see. I was, at first I was nervous that he'd only get men's which would kind of limit his um vision would limit his ability to yeah maybe yeah would limit his ability to really showcase what he's about i think the i think in my opinion i think the reason why we got to see the best of matthew williams or the reason why we got to see matthew williams improve in such a short period of time well, because initially he launched the brand as a women's brand, right? A- a- Alix was essentially just a women's brand. Then it kind of expanded into doing men's. And I think because he came from it, from that POV, maybe using his wife as a muse or his wife's friends or their friends and their little crew, it allowed him to grow as a designer. I think there's something about being able to like, imagine if you were a designer for George Asda, right? Um, coming up as a kid and you just did an internship there after graduating from a prestigious fashion university at Central St. Martins. I think you would be a far better designer having spent two and a half years interning or being a design assistant at George Asda than you would be designing for some eclectic house somewhere. I think the ability to kind of make something outside of what you're used to, especially if you're like a, a wacky creative kid from Central St. Martins, is really going to marry up well with that experience. I think it's a good marriage. I think um, Matthew Williams doing essentially women's wear and then sort of, you know, um, expanding that into men's and then having the women, women's and men's be entirely different people that also live in the same universe. You know, sometimes when they did um their I forgot what they called them when they when they did the the shows where they had men and women walking the runway you could tell that they were from the same sort of world but they had very different aesthetics different very different um cuts very different shapes textures feels all that sort of stuff so i like that they'd be giving him the opportunity to do men's and women's at Givenchy. anyway some people are just not happy some people will never be happy never be pleased and i guess fashion crews like that i guess matthew in this case this is a tweet that kind of sparked this rant um this guy tweeted who happens to be the editor of large at the m which is what a fashion magazine i'm assuming or dem sorry some magazine i don't know dem we are everywhere tag and entertainment from nylon freelance elsewhere dorian blah blah blah. so he um he made this tweet this guy and he said um i hate this entire matthew williams day one at Givenchy series so much but the first picture is truly something else he wants to be moses party in the red sea so bad and it's three pictures that matthew williams uploaded to his instagram that were taken by paolo uh, rivosi i'm pretty sure who's doing most of the first sort of you know pictures um that Givenchy are using very nicely done black and white images of you know matthew williams standing in front of his atelier um walking across the street somewhere in paris with i think members of Givenchy board or something and then him maybe you know walking around the uh, the studio or the office space that he's going to call home for the next for, for the foreseeable future so you know from just a naked point of view it's pretty cool right it's uh it's somebody like matthew williams who knowing his history you know coming no well if you know anything about matthew williams and where he's come from you would it's not surprising that he would be you know in awe at the position that he's at at the moment right he came you know if you just took a snapshot and say the person that was the third member of the band of ben trill is suddenly now the head of Givenchy, you would have never believed it back then right he was hanging out with travis scott and stuff and now look at the progression now look at the evolution so he's allowed to be excited right if this was the end goal if this was his plan anyway when he was making hats and djing and stuff and he had a goal of you know a lofty sort of stretch goal that oh maybe one day i could become a design assistant or i could maybe have a capsule collection with the house essentially he's been given the keys to an historic house in in paris right to essentially bring them or drag them into the 21st century somehow be able to make uh products or skus that sell um all year round somehow capture the youth market reinvigorate um the the clientele they have at the moment it's a really exciting opportunity why shouldn't he be a bit cringe and do these essentially press shots that you know really serve to announce a transition and to kind of show everybody that there's a new chapter that they're about to enter into it's not a bad thing right it really isn't a bad thing i don't necessarily understand why fashion people just can't be happy right they just can't be glad that somebody's getting it but i think part of the reason why 
I think this is happening to Matthew is because it happened to coincide with obviously this whole Black Lives Matter movement, the protest um, after the untimely uh, death of George Floyd at the hands of the police. There is a kind of I get a kind of feeling that they much would have they, they would have rather had a black designer take over Givenchy just because right for tokenism's sake because it would have fit this narrative. So he's kind of suffering from that, which is really unfair considering the amount of work he's done without even saying it out loud. The amount of people he's put on within the black community who he's dressed even problematic characters like ian connor who he's essentially been he's stuck by and been a real friend to people like skepta like he's done a real a lot of good work in terms of the brand ambassadors that he uses on his even his runway yeah he's casting is fucking impeccable so to to kind of be out of order to him in this kind of moment where he sort of should be celebrating and enjoying this historic moment for himself and his family and his team it's just a little bit ugh. but again we shouldn't be surprised it's fashion right fashion people are never happy um they're the most cynical bunch in the world but again i don't see anything wrong with this i, I think virgil did the same thing when he got um appointed artistic director oh, when he got his role um for menswear at louis vuitton he did exactly the same thing he had his whole first day thing they did an entire documentary him talking to a louis vuitton team i remember that where they kind of blurred out all the mood boards that he was um working on like it's a thing that all big brands do why wouldn't they do it? it's a way to introduce like these I, I know for some fashion peeps these brands are very close to your heart or you know you probably don't see them as big corporate as anyone else do but they are they're multi-million dollar sometimes billion dollar corporations that need to act in that way right they need to um, announce to their shareholders and announce to the market things are changing so i'm also taking the reins i don't see anything wrong with it and again i'm not i'm not a fan of cringe but if you're going to be cringe it's going to be when you get a job like this right you should be allowed to be a little bit cringy when you get appointed the creative director of Givenchy for fuck's sake especially after you just used to design upside down new york yankees hats come on man come on anyway big up matthew williams anyway man you're doing you're doing the lord's work don't listen to the haters brother next on the list this is a point um just roughly just thinking about everything that's going on especially with the techno scene there's loads of really weird arguments about race and politics on the dance floor and you know no one's really got the answers but part of the thing that's confusing and annoying about it is coming from a sports background or coming from you know just playing sports following sports for a long time you have this appreciation for the egalitarian nature of sports, the fact that it's, you know, the best man usually wins, right? Um, there are some, of course, there's politics in sports. You know, there, 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 there is some situations some people can point to where people have been essentially sabotaged, right, and held back. But for the most part, you do the work, you're talented, um, you have the right breaks, you can essentially get to the pinnacle of the mountain, right? And it's either you're good or you're not. <coughs> It's very black and white. Um, whereas with anything else, especially within the creative fields or entertainment industry, it's very hard to look somebody in the eye who's black and who doesn't necessarily get the same opportunities as the white campus apart and tell them it's totally nothing to do with race. Even though as much as I would like to tell them it, because I think the whole conversation around race is incredibly boring and doesn't necessarily get at the root of the problem, doesn't necessarily ask the right questions, you can't necessarily be, I can't say with any kind of confidence that it just isn't a race thing. There is some race that plays into it, but sports is not like that. Sports is just black and white, you're good or you're not. But there's also a really interesting part of sports where the redemption arc is amazing. Everyone wants to see, but like sports, especially David Beckham is a good example. Um, you know, David Beckham was a darling of English football at one point, right? Um, this amazing, um, stylish footballer, you know, voice of a little five-year-old, but essentially he dressed really well. He looked amazing. Your mum wanted to bang him. Your sister wanted to bang him. Your school teacher wanted to bang him. Your dad wanted to be him. Your brother wanted to have his hair cut. Um, or your dad was living vicariously for him. Your brother wanted to have his trims. Just a cool dude, right? Married to a Spice Girl. Um, you know, she goes on to launch her fashion brand. Just in place for some of the best clubs in the world in paris milan manchester madrid just uh, you know la just incredible incredible footballer but he went through a process where he was you know again the you know the apple of the english people's eye and then suddenly he was you know um banished but people wanted to see his redemption story they wanted to see him come back after getting a boot you know chucked at his head from sir Alex ferguson during his last season with may united and this brings me on to the point um, this issue with Joe Hart. Joe Hart was a former England number one, a former in Manchester City number one, was once heralded as one of the best keepers in the UK or sometimes in Europe. And he just got recently released by Burnley, right? He went he went there, I think maybe, I, I forgot what successful spell he had. I think it might have been an Italian club before he went to Burnley, but he essentially got let go from Burnley. And that's been a real, real, real um, 
steep uh, decline in his career. He went from, again, being the number one goalkeeper at Man City, number one goalkeeper at England, to now suddenly being released from Burnley. And now he's without a job. Um, but the beauty of it, the silver lining, is that he's going to have an opportunity to come back again. Right, there's an opportunity for you to redeem yourself, and it's just about whether you're good or not. No politics, no nothing involved. And they kind of touch upon it in this little clip here from Football Daily. Uh, Mark Schwartz, a former Premier League goalkeeper, for me with uh, Fulham, sort of touches on it, and I'm going to play the clip for you now. Usually surprised, usually surprised that that there's been such a fall from from being the number one goalkeeper at Manchester City to now, you know, not even being offered an extension on his contract at Burnley. That 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 is a huge surprise to me. Had someone had said that. You know, three, four years ago, five years ago, I think people just would have said, you're mad. You've got no clue. And I think you would have been... I mean, I would have probably agreed with them. Um, so, you know, to, to have fallen from... If you want to say fallen from grace as, as dramatically as he has, that is a huge surprise uh, for me. Um, what he needs to do is go and find somewhere where he's going to be consistent, where he's going to be playing. He's going to be number one. He's going to be almost a little bit out of the limelight and try and find some consistency again. And uh, he needs games under his belt. He needs to try and iron out any of the, the doubts that he may have in his head about his own performance. And that's a weird thing as well, because I, re I relate this a lot to like what's going on with DJing, because I'm thinking about this a lot after reading the Kevin Saunderson article from uh, Billboard, when he's talking about, you know, inclusivity in music and the lack of black representation, all this stuff. There is a part of it where you kind of have to like, you really have to ask yourself the question. It's hard to do so because it's so murky out there. Isn't it? You're not really sure if you're not getting the looks because it's like if you go to a job interview, right? Do you really want to know why you didn't get the job? Sometimes, you know, they say, I'll oh, get feedback from an interview. It's like, do you really want the feedback, though? Especially the, depending on what kind of feedback they give you. But sometimes if they if they want to be honest and want to be brutally honest and give you some, you know, and they adhere to the radical honesty mantra, then that's good. But if they're just going to extend pleasantries about, you know, you not saying a certain experience thing that you had in your CV or whatever, maybe you're not using a certain, you know, fucking phrase, that's not really helpful. But if they were really helpful and try to actually tell you why you didn't get the job, like, you know, pinpointing things about your personality, about your experience, about the places that you were at, maybe the feedback they got from other members of the team that you worked with in previous jobs. That probably would be do a lot of harm than good because no one actually wants to know the real truth. But sports is brilliant like that because you're constantly being given harsh truths, harsh realities you're having to face up. Your body just not reacting or operating the same way that you'd like it to, right? Your physical ability is just diminishing over time. Um um the current state of football just changing right the the things people want just moving a different way i think joe Hart's suffering from that he was a goalkeeper who was really um um heralded for his shot stopping ability but then it got to a point where shot stopping wasn't enough for goalkeepers you had to be able to control the ball be able to play the ball out from the back be able to come out and be commanding in the box which he was never what that guy um there's loads of things that just that are out of your control that you just have to kind of evolve or adapt to <clears throat> Or unfortunately, sorry about that. Or unfortunately, you just wither away and die. And I think that's part of the issue that's happening now at the moment with the inclusivity conversation in techno or in electronic music. There is a part of it where there's, there's there. I'm not denying that there probably is some sort of systemic issues at play that are not allowing certain people from certain demographics to progress and get further in their career or within the scene. But there also has to be a really honest conversation about how we assess each other's skills especially in comparison especially when you compare people from different backgrounds with different skill sets from different network groups whatever it may be that's been an honest conversation around that because i don't think it's as easy as just saying oh because i'm black and that person's white and they were in the game for five years and that was we, we, they were both in the same game for five years experience wise learning how to dj how come she pays a burger and i don't it's not just about race there's more questions there there's more things that has to be said right i even i've had a lot of those kind of reflective moments of myself when it came to um having to hang up the whole promotion uh promotion the no, promoter sort of like cool guy hat that i had when i was in dawson that was part of my i tired identity anyone that knows me for that time knows that i was very proud of the amount of nonsense i got up to on any given weekend in dawson right kings and road and the alibi and all these other pubs i went to down there right most of the other by actually but i was proud of that identity i had right i wore it like a badge of honor right putting on nights that's so special for like four years was, was you know one of the highlights of my life and introduced me to a whole bevy of people who i kind of you know who i really hold close to my heart and, in, and you know exposed me to different parts of the creative industry as well that allowed me to have the career that i have now at the moment so it's been amazing but i had to have a conversation with myself when it 
kind of was made clear that I wasn't necessarily getting the same opportunities and the same chances to put on nights or to teach in certain places. And I couldn't, I couldn't honestly tell myself it was racism because it clearly wasn't because it was other people getting booked the same, you know, um, who were from the same background as I was. It was just a, a case of, you know, your time now has come, right? You have to make room for others. Like the the bar owner had to prioritize um, making sure his bar would survive the inevitable fall off that most sort of like seminal, um, you know, seminal sort of bars to go through right mud club i can think of had the same thing studio 54 had this falling up every sort of like seminal you know hole in the wall club dance floor place has a bit of a fall off right where they have to sort of reinvent themselves and you don't do that with the old guard you have to have to introduce some new blood in there so if you get dashed to one side you have to have your own conversation about yourself and or really come to a realization that you might not be cool anymore you might not be what they want in that scene it's a bit of an ego dent, right? It's going to bruise your ego. It's a bit of a gut punch, but that's exactly what's going on. You can't ascribe that to racism. And you have to kind of change tack. Then, you know, you have to re evolve like Madonna has done, right? Throughout her entire career. You have to kind of evolve with the time, every decade or maybe less than, than a decade. You have to kind of change your sound, change your appearance, change your artistic direction, whatever it may be, just so you can survive. And I think sports teaches you that. You have no other option right unless you evolve you will essentially be put out to pasture and i think it's gonna be interesting to see what joe hart does um on the other side of this right because essentially he's been he's been he keeps getting messages from the industry or from the you know yeah from the industry that he's not at the current level that they would like right he they want a goalkeeper that offers a lot more than shot stopping and he has to just do that he has to get better at distributing the ball with his feet get better at commanding his box get better at just being an as a, 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 i don't know a deep lining sweeper for his team whatever it may be he has to just do that or he won't be able to or he won't get hired again or he won't be um a priority the number one goalkeeper pick for another team a professional team anywhere for the most part i just thought it's interesting just to kind of observe in it how cutthroat and how black and white it is in sports but also how humane it is also because there's the door's always open as long as you're good as long as you're able to prove that you're good you can come back in again um so yeah that's my force on the old joe hart thing all right next on the list what else we talk about here um yeah, this Karen video was a bit upsetting. Again, I think it's probably um, it's probably run its course, but just in terms of an observation about what's kind of going on in society at the moment, I've kind of had enough with this cancer, this kind of public shaming of Karens a little bit, especially when it's not warranted. There are situations where, you know, like that woman that got slapped in the uh, petrol station, right, by a Latina girl. Do you remember that one? Or Hispanic, I don't know how you, whatever, whatever they, whatever you would um, ascribe her to be. I'm sure, sure she's Latina, right? I'm pretty sure. Um, she was talking reckless, said something derogatory, and the Latina girl did not hesitate and just slapped her across the face and you kept it moving. That's all that needs to happen. You don't need to go around and phoning the people's employers and doing whatever it may be. People just need to get a slap or a punch in the face. Most of these Karens who are talking reckless, who are going up to, you know, minorities and telling them how to live their lives and telling them off for any kind of social interaction that they think that they should not be doing or whatever it may be, they just need to get punched in the face. They're enough do they they're bottom feeder do gooders who have essentially skirted by their entire life with nobody pulling them up and telling them that they're being a bit of a brat. That's all they need, but they don't need their whole lives destroyed by vigilantes with smartphones in their hands. And I think this is a perfect example of it. This guy called Carlos Dillard uh, decided to f follow and record this supposed Karen because they got into some sort of traffic altercation where she essentially flipped him off. He felt aggrieved by it. So that natural thing that everyone does, I'm not sure why that's a thing, In because again, I don't have a car, but it's a thing that people do when they get into some sort of altercation with somebody on the road where they follow them around and i'm guessing most of the reason why is because when somebody drives off it's all like them cutting the argument it's all like they hung up and you want them to keep, keep making your point so you follow them in a the car like nah they're gonna learn today they're gonna learn they're gonna learn and then you, you get in it you get you know you get side by side to them and you keep berating them again or you get behind them or if you're lucky enough you happen to stop at the same car park they're in and then you keep you know keep arguing um so it's a natural thing that people do but i guess the fact that he went and recorded the whole interaction from when he got you know she obviously rushed back to her home because she's scared um she doesn't know what's going on she's having a bit of a manic episode which happens a bit later he keeps on recording he keeps on recording keeps pestering her when she's clearly um you know she's clearly kind of 
gone completely nuts. Whether or not she's nuts to begin with, whether or not she's having an actual manic episode because she's reliving or retelling all these other instances that have happened in the past of other Karens who've had their whole lives destroyed via one viral video. She's covering her face, trying to cover her license plate. And this guy's just carrying on and on and on. And I think she needs to stop. It just needs to stop, especially because this dude ended up being a complete bottom feeder because it, end, it transpires moments later, as soon as the video went viral, he then decided to drop T-shirts, right, with Are You Okay, Karen, as a caption on the front. I'll play a little bit of it now at the moment, but it's pretty apprehensive. It's pretty different. It's pretty uh, deplorable, really, to be honest. Like, an absolute scumbag of a dude taking advantage of the situation and trying to virtue signal and also trying to, you know, become a celebrity in his own right, right? A viral celebrity in that case. <laughs> Karen, you are you don't okay? Understand what's happening. Can you explain to me calmly? No, because you're attacking me right now. I'm not attacking you. you. Ma'am, you flicked me you're off. Ready. You're ready to take it. Guys, this is her license plate. No Imagine, what are you doing? Like, why should she have to explain herself to you? You had an argument and you were driving in your car. You had a flip. And again, this is what I don't understand this current era we're in. Why can't two adults just have a disagreement? It's like that whole thing that happened with, is it Alison Roman and um, what's her face? Um, John Legend's wife. It was made into a big deal, but essentially she was a bit jealous. Yeah, a bit jealous. Uh, Chrissy Teigen, yeah, that's her name, right? Chrissy Teigen and Alison Roman had a bit of a falling out. Um, you know, these, um, what do you call it? These cutesy home chefs having a bit of a falling out. One happens to be a, a super duper celebrity. The other happens to be a celebrity in like, you know, a bit of a microwave, but a celebrity in her own right too, right? She has a, a really uh, cult following behind her. They have a falling out or mostly based because Alison Roman decided to um, essentially uh, divulge the fact that she's unhappy that... Um, Chrissy Teigen and the lady that does all the feng shui stuff about home interior um, are getting all the looks and she isn't, right? Because she she would say, oh, because I think she's upset Chrissy Teigen was doing the collaboration with some big major brand. Whatever. She was just a bit jealous. You're allowed to be jealous. You're allowed to be a bit of a hater. You're allowed to be upset. You're allowed to have a bit of an, a, an altercation, a disagreement with somebody who happens to be your peer. You're allowed to do that. It's fine. You're allowed to have it out. But instead, they turned it into some racial thing. They turned it into, uh, you know, women not banding together and all this nonsense. And she has to, uh, as a Roman writes a flipping essay, apologizes three or four times. And, you know, they try to dig out another image of her, trying to cancel her because she wore an Amy Winehouse outfit. Just absolute nonsense. Like, what the hell are you guys doing? Two adults had a falling out. Cool. Safe. One adult decided to be dramatic about it. Okay, cool. Safe. Go home. Just go home. I don't get it. She flipped you off. She didn't bloody go to your home and stick a flipping shotgun in your, in your mom's mouth and say hasta la vista and, and pull the trigger. No, she flipped you off when you were having a bit of a disagreement on the road. What is the big deal? Honestly, where is the issue here? I don't see the issue. Number she lives here. This is her address. And he knows exactly what he's doing. He's recording, he's, he's doing the whole license plate thing. Do, put, of course, essentially doxing this woman live on camera. Uh, Twitter didn't take this down, right? But Twitter are quick to, you know, um, they're quick to put warning bloody labels on Donald Trump's tweet, but they're not worried about this whole vigilante cancelling of Karen's because she happened to fit into the archetype. She's a bit of a nutcase. Yeah. Is she a bit of a bitch? Probably. But does it warrant going to her house and recording her having a manic episode outside of her, outside of her apartment? No. <laughs> Karen, you flipped me off. No, you can't. cut me off. And again, it could be all theatrics, but it's, this is just so unnecessary. Oh. And flipped me off, and now you're playing the victim. Ma'am, would you like to calm down? No, you're attacking me right now. Even Guys, she flipped me off. She literally flipped me off, and then she tried to come home. She's Karen. Karen, would you like to calm down and have a conversation? Why are you... Anyway, that's the whole video. And then some people come around, ban around, and he still tries to kill Abra and Karen. And it's just deplorable, really, man. I've had enough of it, man. I'm done. Unless it's a warranted Karen incident, which there's been many of, this is not warranted. You don't need to follow somebody all the way home, right? And essentially broadcast their address for the internet in order to prop yourself up. It's really disgusting. Is this the kind of fame you want? Is this the kind of celebrity you want? Is this how you want to pull your family out from the uh, pits of poverty? by cancelling somebody who happened to put a middle finger up at you how infantile is that i'm gonna call the police because you did a middle finger it's like grow up man grow up is this the fight that we want to have as black people really is this the fight we want and again it's only it's only a valid karen interaction because he happens to be black by the way if this guy was white would this would this have the same sort of virality will people give a shit probably not
It's insane. It has, honestly, it's insane. It really annoys me. Like, grow up, man. Like, God damn you guys. But hey, what do I know? God damn. Anyway, move on. Next topic to talk about. Let's get into Kevin Saunderson's views on race because this is going to be an interesting one because I'm conflicted, conflicted, conflicted about some of the statements that have been made. And I don't really know where I sit on this, but I do know that it's not fully just a thing about let's just get more black people involved in the scene. It's it's a bit more of a, it's a complex issue that requires a, more of a nuanced answer. I don't think it's black and white, right? This is my interpretation of it, but... Um, on Techno Twitter, this article was, you know, lighting up the timeline, right? Everyone was talking about it. People were saying that they were crying. People were saying it touched their heart. People were saying that they wanted to stab themselves with a turntable needle. It was all the rage, right? All the rage. And um, there's a lot of truth to what Kevin Saunders is saying, right? Um, a pioneer in the scene who essentially feels as if he's been left out of the conversation when it comes to being a legend or a legacy actor within the techno music industry, right? Especially if we look at other genres and how they treat their legacy, quote, older acts, he feels as if he's being sort of like, you know, um, put out to pasture, um, overlooked for essentially younger, fresher talent, and in some cases, talent that happens to be the same age as him, but have a different complexion. Really interesting points regarding the whole interview. I'll read some bits of it now to kind of give you a bit of an idea, but I've also written down some of my own points regarding um, the entire issue and what's going on. So let's read some points here, get through the thing. So there's the interview. So it says, da, 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 da. this is interesting. One interesting, another interesting kind of introduction to everything that's going on. The interviewer asked him the following. When you were pioneering electronic music in the 80s, did it feel in, uh, distinctively racial or distinctly a product of black culture? Or was that just not something that's crossing your mind? And Kevin answers, music was very segregated at that time. When I started making music, musically you had R&B radio, you had pop radio, and most tracks were rock and roll and very pop and by white artists. Black artists would be on R&B stations. When we started creating the sound, um, it was only black people who were listening to the music that was being made by myself, Dwan, Aikins, Derek, um, Eddie Folks, and Blake Baxter. The handful of people in Detroit who were making this music were all black artists. We had a handful of people who came out of dance music from like, uh, who came out to dance, like 600 to 700 people who'd come out just about every party. It was all black, simple as that. The great thing about Europe was that they had a different approach. Is if your shit was uh, hot, they'd love your music and they embraced it. That's what um, ignited techno. But then when I got here, when, but when I got there in America, the things that they, the first things they said was, we love your music but you have to go through the R&B division first that was so weird to me I was like what are you talking about these records for everybody it doesn't even fit into R&B radio it doesn't mean black people won't like it but we should just go across the broad um, this just uh, let's just put the record out and let the people make the choice I got a lot of type of stuff I got a lot of that type of stuff during those days which again is very disconcerting right this idea that there's such a but again it kind of echoes the same experience that uh, James Baldwin had right the idea that he was always confronted with this issue of race when he was back home and the moment he migrated across to uh, Paris for a, a few years to go and live right and fall in love he essentially was met with a system that was classist but wasn't racist in the same way it is in America right he was able to for the first time be respected or be looked upon as a public intellectual without it being a without being ascribed being a black public intellectual and I guess artist in different areas, in different genres, we're going through exactly the same thing that he's going through, right? Saying that coming to Europe, you're one thing, go back to America, it's another thing completely. So I completely get him on that point. Next question. Um, obviously, mainstream dance music um, exploded in popularity in the States during the last decade. Within the context of that boom, uh, did you observe a significant racial disparity? He says, it grew into a multi-billion dollar industry. It grew into festi these festivals. So much came from our imprint on this music that led to other influences that led to the music being made by whoever was inspired, which is fine. America's take on it at the least previously was that this music was made by Europeans on white people only or white people only and that black people just didn't touch it because it didn't fit into R&B or hip hop and it didn't have the same soul or feeling I think it became very commercialized with EDM and you had all these managers working with different promoters and bringing the acts in and trying to create a gimmick even the Kentucky Fried Chicken thing that happened at Ultra Music Festival is the greatest of music very very true um, and then next one talking about EDM was a bit I wanted to talk about there's a bit here that I thought was very of note duh, 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 duh. Ba, 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 ba. do you have an account uh, so anyway let me read my point so the whole this is kind of the whole premise of the whole argument right but he's got another touching point but let me read some of my points that i kind of written down here regarding the entire article that i thought 
would be of note. Let's go back to the top here for you guys. So these are my points regarding the join, sorry, the Kevin Saunderson interview. So um, there is an issue here about um, trying, is it possible? Because same as the conversation I had about football. There has to be a point where, as an artist in any genre, especially regardless of if the roots of the genre or the musical, yeah, because the roots it doesn't. It's hard, isn't it? Really, when something gets whitewashed, how do you get it back to its roots? It's, can you actually reverse that? Is that possible? Would you want that to happen? I don't know. But let's just operate with. Let's just operate in the idea that the world is as it is, and you have to kind of operate in it at the moment right you can't necessarily create this thing out of thin air or recreate this thing out of thin air you just have to operate in the world as is if that's the case it, there is a part of me that thinks you need to be your own worst critic and sort of evolve and maybe develop your sound in some way shape or form to fit in with what's going on at the moment again it's annoying it doesn't really line up with the artist's integrity it's probably not something a lot of people want to do especially if you're an older act why should you do that you essentially lay the blueprint i understand those points but if you do because again most of kevin Saunderson's um complaints come from the idea that he isn't playing the big festivals the big clubs it's not necessarily he's not able to make a career that's a different conversation if he wasn't able just to make a living uh playing music or creating music that he loves that'll be a concern but he feels that he's not getting the same looks as like a Sven Var, right which is a f unfair comparison because Sven Var, you know is a bit of an anomaly in that case um but it's just it, i don't know like can you not look at yourself a little bit in the mirror and say what could i do to maybe adapt to what's going on and if you don't want to adapt is there also a question of just doing your own thing and allowing the people that like you for that thing that you do to support you and the people that don't they don't it is what it is but if you want to go play in the big leagues it's sort of like complaining that if you it's sort of complaining yeah i say the same sort of thing if you went to have a pop number one record but you didn't want to make a pop record that wouldn't make any sense in it right part of the reason why you'd want to make a song that would be number one the worldwide right would be because part of the reason why you would do that is because you'd want to exercise that part of your artistic arsenal right do i have the ability to make generic run-of-the-mill background music in a shopping mall but for some people they couldn't do it but if you want to do that there's some things you have to do you have to compromise yourself in some way shape or form so i think some of these legacy acts probably are unwilling to do that because again they have a legitimate reason man they they essentially invented a genre of music right i understand it but i think part of the kind of friction from this comes from that another point uh gather data this is something i think was mentioned in an article i read uh maybe a couple of days ago regarding the idea of inclusivity in fashion and somebody on the board of the CFDA, a black lady made a really good point about you no know, having to trying to understand exactly what's going on, gathering the necessary data points so that you can address the issues that need to be addressed. And then the things that we think are the issue, sometimes the data won't reflect that. And now you see a lot in sports, right? Sometimes people would say one thing about a player, but then the data, um, you know, says a completely different thing. So you have to kind of marry those two things up, like gather the data, like who, um, is there a demand for um, more inclusivity in lineups regardless right and then you can poll people whatever it may be um what's available out there how many people of a certain talent level are there to pick from or are they based or say back oh. there's all these conversations need to be had around that right and then from there you can really enact some change i think so um the other one um it's an argument for the whole like you know one it's maybe your fault thing right um supposedly there's there was one hundred and thirty thousand techno records released on beatport alone right so that does show there's an appetite for that music it's not as if like customers are getting tired or they have fatigue over new tunes right new subgenres are popping up every single day so there's obviously a demand for it it's just about how you try to align your vision your artistic output with what people want like there has to be some sort of marriage some sort of conversation regarding that um secondly another point promoters and club owners are partly to blame it's a boys club where they look after each other which is great if you're friends with them but bad if you're trying to break through um but in their defense they're only looking uh, at what contributes their bottom line so this is a really important part of it because promoters and and booking agents like or whatever they may be they hold a uh, insane amount of influence and power in the scene it really is frightening if you think about it because there's probably enough clubs to go around for everyone to play in i would say just of just of you know off the top of my head there's probably enough nightclubs out there for everyone to have a career in music i think the problem comes when your uh, ambitions 
it are uh, you know you want to be the next tiesto or something right that's when it gets a bit tricky because there's there's only enough room for a certain amount of those people to do that thing right but if you want to have a career making music and djing around the world i think most people could do it especially if you're good right it can be done but the issue is that there most of these especially the, the festivals that you want to go to or the clubs that you want to go to they're controlled or managed by a small group of promoters and agents who essentially look after each other right which isn't a bad thing i think if you've ever been at a party or a wedding right where there's been a terrible dj playing there you know that the disparity in djing is really really wide right it goes from crappy wedding dj to a really amazing guy playing records vinyl records in like some dingy pub somewhere in the middle of bethnal green right there's no knowing what it's like a it's like a flip of a coin because like i've always said djing is like the lowest barrier of entry in terms of getting into the entertainment industry right if you want to be an actor you know again you have to you know dedicate yourself to that crowd for an x number of years maybe do some stage time you want to be a singer you have to sing rapper you have to know how to rap uh, being a band you got to know how to play an instrument but djing just requires you know a couple of you know hours watching a couple of youtube uh, videos and just essentially spending hours trying to beat match the same record right on a midi player or on virtual dj via your desktop it doesn't it's not hard to uh, essentially start um, your career in djing so with that said there's going to be a lot more people right it's just it's just oversubscribed it's just too many djs right not the ones that want to make it don't get me wrong but just too many doing it regardless which then creates you know a, a hard it's hard just to break through in general i think for most people i don't even think it's a black or white thing i think there's a lot of white artists out there who are you know desperately trying to break through desperately trying to con connect with labels and again absolutely no love especially the ones that are mainly producers and that you know happen to dj because they just want to get more gigs it's difficult for everybody out there i think in the most part but i think the issue is that the promoters and the booking agents need to diversify their lineups they're just too lazy they just take the easy option um they don't try and take any risks um they're afraid of effectively having no one turn up because they're not booking the same old lineup they booked five years ago it's a really weird way to kind of um, sustain or to maintain this scene that we all know and love, really. Because, you know, if you don't keep it fresh, if you don't introduce new voices, new pe new talent, you're essentially going to contribute to this stuff dying out over the next few years. But anyway, next one. Um, is there a market for legacy techno acts? Apart from Sven Vi, maybe a few other, you know, there's a few more of those, Carl Craig's and everybody else included. Um, who else from that era can headline a big club festival and sell tickets? Um, is there, if there's no appetite for it, some legacy acts will have to lower their expectations and be okay to play max capacity 500 people rooms. Um, it's not Red Bull money, but it's still a great living. That's the thing. It's just trying to align your expectations. Like what do you actually want from it? If you want to be, headlining big festivals year in year out it's going to take something from you as well right you have to compromise some part of your artistry you're gonna have to do things that you're probably not comfortable to do in order to kind of maintain that level of um exposure in the market if you just want to have a career and just tour i think it's possible to do as a legacy act it really is maybe you have to it's going to take a dent in your ego you might have to play a couple of room twos here and there and be a warm-up act here and there but you could do it so it really is that that's the question for her because i think and again is there is there an appetite for legacy acts do people within the techno or electronic music space do they want to go and see some of the people who are fundamental who are kind of cause again because no one knows the history of techno really right the especially the black history of techno the detroit history of techno do they actually know it um this, this has got a very european slant for the most part the history you know starts and ends at you know trezor or something so that's maybe a wider conversation about how do you re-educate a consumer base that essentially only knows techno through the prism of Europe. They don't know it through from the American side of things. That's an interesting point to kind of um, really think about. And again, it's a nuanced answer, complex answer, complex questions require complex answers. Another one. Um, is it more of an issue in America than Europe? Because I don't know what, because for the most part, from what you can tell in the article, it does seem like Kevin Swanson is complaining more so about the American market, which is, you know, still in its, it's I wouldn't say it's not in, in its infancy, but it's still trying to, you know, figure out where exactly, what electronic music means in, a, in, in America, right? Is it EDM? Is it LA house and disco culture? Is it um the sort of i don't know the avant-garde queer alternative scene in in the east coast like what is it really like you don't really know you don't really put a button a finger on it so i think that's a question that needs to be said and again 
can you really expect a Coachella to know um, the heritage of techno or electronic music and have those artists headline a stage or something? I don't necessarily think that's fair. Will they? That's not their. Pur it's not within their purview. It requires maybe some more grassroots operations to maybe give them that platform um, in order to kind of get the message out in a wider way. And then maybe if somebody, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, somebody from that team on the Coachella side sees it, they can maybe, you know, lend a helping hand and maybe extend the invitation for that kind of bigger platform. Another one. Uh, la, 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 la. Um, oh, the bit about the, yeah, the bit that hurt me most was the bit about the promoter, right? It's a bit of really brutal part which kind of echoes a lot of experience i think a lot of people have had when you try and get in a gig because there needs to be said also out loud then getting gigs is really difficult regardless of your background man getting a gig being able to play in a club is super hard like i said there's so many people out there djing um especially crap people right people that have no business being behind decks that are just wasting people's times um people that essentially give us a bad name right they come unprepared they get smashed behind the decks they don't play in with the appropriate volume they don't read the room just completely complete amateur shows right that basically um lead to some promoters or bar owners being a little bit picky about who they let play in their bar or club so it results in us kind of fighting of scrapping pulling each other's eyes out for crappy 100 dollar gigs right that um are crappy but they're the only way that we get to play out in front of a crowd and get that experience again um djing much like comedy you can't learn to dj at home in your bedroom you sort of can fundamentals, right? You can maybe learn how to do set up punchline, whatever it may be at home. But in order to really know if you're funny, in order to really know if those jokes are going to land, you need to do it in front of an audience. Same with a DJ. In order to know if that transition is going to work, if that mix makes sense, if what you're playing is good, you're going to have to go out there and play in front of people. But it's just hard to just do it in the first place. So to hear Kevin Saunders, an absolute legend with 30 plus years in the game, having to go through the same things I go through is a madness. So this is one of the, um, where is it? Uh, it's a, a buddy, buddy, buddy. Is a really mad when he said it. I was upset. Where is it? Da, 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 kind of, yeah, this one. Um, uh, yeah. So this is, and the question here is about: um, Do you feel like the people who produce the biggest dance events, let's say Ultra, EDC, or Coachella, have a responsibility to book more black artists, right? And he says a quite easy answer here. I said I think so. The problem is that many of the people in power in these companies don't really care, and they don't really know. Um, some of these, uh, some of them also came in after the fact that they don't care about the history or integrity of the music; they care about the money. So yeah, they've got a responsibility to correctly represent the culture they're profiting from, but responsibility in their mind is only to make money, which I've always kind of understood. I think when you go to most of these festivals, you do get an understanding that it is at some way, in some point it is like a kind of a flex for the person that putting it on just because, you know, the the finance, the economy, the, the economics of putting together a festival, especially ones with like big headliners playing, you're not going to make that much money on unless you're really, really clever with what you're doing. Most of the people are just doing it because they just want to do it, right? It's like a rich rich man's toy play thing, whatever it may be. Um, and you get the feeling that they don't really care. They're just, you know, essentially trying to put on a party for their friends, essentially, on a really high level, but just trying to put on a party for their friends. And here this experience that um, Kevin had with one of these big agency people, right? So it's another, it's a part that really kind of broke my heart. So it's a thing. It says, a question, have you had any personal experiences with that type of thinking? And Kevin says, I talked to a gentleman at one of the leading global agencies. A promoter friend told me to call him because I re recreated um, in a city and we were going back to the on the road and we did some touring and we were working on a new album. I thought, let me get the US agent who's got some power and has a good roster. I left a message and he called me back, which is a great, right? Imagine in a city going on a tour, they're back together. It would be flipping amazing. You could do some really interesting stuff around where they play, some cool activation some cool radio spots like it's be a great idea on principle and here here how it went so here's kevin's words so the guy i'm talking to him and he was like hey how can i help you and i said this is kevin saunderson and i wanted to talk to you about maybe doing some future business and touring together he said well who are you i don't even know anything about you i don't know who you are and i can imagine how condescending that tone must have been right to an absolute legend because imagine imagine getting left a voicemail by kevin saunderson from inner city right wouldn't you want to google his name and find out if that's actual kevin saunderson that you're thinking of right maybe check out a couple interviews see what he posted recently on twitter you'd want to do some investigation but the arrogance right the gumption of like he probably thought how dare this guy even call me about a gig like does he know who i am it's like oh disgusting and it continues it says the interviewer wow that happened kevin says i was thinking first of all 
if you call me back, you should really do some research. Um, some search really, especially if there's a top guy. At least ask some of your agents. He's older than me, so he should know. The point is that he's he was very arrogant and I didn't know if it was a co a colour thing or what. But he was like, I don't know your music, I don't know who you are, and we take top artists around this agency. It was a bunch of bullshit. I was like, You shouldn't have ever called me back and this is a waste of my time. He didn't even let me finish what I was saying. I was giving him some history, but uh but uh, but I'm not some old fart who doesn't know what's up. Uh, I play around the world and understand the music i created this music and as old as i am i'm a futurist still so for him to say we're not interested i was like well i'm not interested either and after having this conversation if you don't have those platforms we have to go through a different agent and we have to start smaller and work our way up so it was a real strange conversation for me even for me recreating his brand and uh, already touring the world doing stuff like glastonbury killing it at glastonbury and in europe i'm still fighting for inner city to move forward as we've restructured the act but how is a young artist supposed to get an opportunity when all you have are these executives at high levels blocking them for whatever reason whether racial or just unaware and again i would i would caution i would say caution on the whole racial thing i just think they don't like you said in the beginning they just don't give a shit they don't care like um it's a boys club like i mentioned they just want to look after their friends and again it happens in all it happens even for up and coming DJs of all colors and races. It's a thing. It's just what it is. They look after each other. And again, most of it has come because most of it comes from the purview of like, you've been burned too many times, giving random people chances and they're terrible. And it also comes around the idea of like, you just don't want any headaches. You want to be able to just book somebody and know that they're going to get the job done because you trust them and they're your friend of yours. You don't give anyone else a chance. But then it goes into this whole circle jerk thing where you don't let anybody else in. It gets a bit clicky. And that's when they can become a bit toxic and become um, detrimental to the longevity of the scene in general. Because if you're not having fresh new faces coming in you're not going to have a scene that's going to function later on and especially in this era right with corona happening there's a, there's a lot of djs that have had to go back home to their native countries or people have moved away whatever it may be bars need to then start reaching out to local djs who they've probably been poo-pooing for the most part right they've been you know favoring um, other people from outside of the nation to come and play or maybe have bigger names and paying bigger fees now you're gonna have to rely on you know grassroots local people to actually you know get you back up and running so i thought that was the most heartbreaking part of it anyway going to my notes here blah, 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 last couple of bits um he said yeah and i said oh but we can't go around calling the entire scene racist because it's it's, it's um it isn't it's because it isn't especially in europe it's more complicated than that which is true the american electronic music scene there's obviously a conversation about racism has to be had because you know living in america it is what it is in europe it's a bit more complex there are issues especially in germany you look at their complicated history they have with nazism you look at us in england as well we have a very complicated history with music in general right you look at the rave scene in the 80s that was mostly a, a white um, uprising in that regard and they quelled that immediately so it's a very complicated conversation i have to be had between working class people um you know um how you identify with you how you identify yourself really complicated issues need to be had but they're not just under the banner of racism especially in europe i think in my experience and then the last one puppety puppety ba um no, I think that's it really on that point. Yeah, I think that's it. But it's a really good interview. I really recommend you check it out. Again, it's a lot of conversations that need to be had regarding the issue of race in electronic music and how we go about addressing it. Again, I've mentioned it previously. I'm not a fan of affirmative action when it comes to lineups. I don't think we should just have for every white person have one black person. I don't think I actually understand. I don't think I guess the root of the problem or addresses it in any meaningful way. Um, it's just tokenism in my experience or from what I know. Um, I'm also not, I'm, uh, not a big fan of the 50-50 gender splits either. I don't think that's beneficial either i think there needs to be a conversation around how we actually have the dance floors reflected in the dj booth and vice versa how we have a conversation around providing safe spaces we have a conversation around you know um uh drug safety loads of real conversation needs to be had right um that needs to take place in a in a um, in an environment where people don't feel as if they're like being cornered into a position where or being you know called out of their name because essentially they don't ascribe to a certain viewpoint that makes them racist i don't think that's a really beneficial way to go about the conversation and again i could be wrong but who knows but anyway check it out it's on billboard now uh it's called uh dance music kevin pioneer uh dance music pioneer kevin Swanson, the scene is still falling failing black artist sorry um it's on billboard i'll link in the show notes for you guys so check out yourself it's on the it'll be in the description I'll make sure you check it down below for you to read it yourself <coughs> um last bit of news before we head out before i go out for a run actually um kanye has linked up with 
Gap. Kanye has announced a 10 year, or well, yeah, 10 year deal with Gap. Um, he's essentially, you know, lived up to his promise of doing a collaboration with Gap and wanting to, sorry, wanting to design for Gap, you know, a promise or a goal that he had in mind for himself where he went to um, design on the biggest platform possible, essentially drag uh, Gap into the 21st century, drag them back into the popular co modern, co oh yeah, the current conversation when it comes to fashion. Um, it's an incredible, incredible, incredible partnership. And again, for a brand that no one was talking about, thinking about, you know, two weeks ago to suddenly be you know on the lips of everybody is a genius move and again aligning themselves with Yeezy Yeezy then going out and hiring a whole bevy of you know the who's who in talent to kind of lead that charge is amazing so let's go through how it announced um, Kanye tweeted which he hasn't done in a while even throughout the whole Black Lives Matter issue and the protests that's happening all across North America he has remained mute and essentially spoke um, with action you know contributed mad millions to charities and organizations he went and marched on the streets of chicago he's just been dealing with things a lot better than he did when he was going through that whole debacle with trump and calling him daddy and stuff right he's essentially learned his lesson i think if that's a right way to go about it right um but yeah it's a it's a good thing so he essentially put this tweet out earlier in the day that said worst West day ever with a picture of a person kneeling over zipping up a bag that essentially has a gap written on it which is what people spot it was a gap collaboration a sort of tote bag with a nice duffel coat i'm assuming it looks like um red bomber jacket sort of padded coat the iconic blue hoodie that he said was a perfect hoodie remember Tr um sorry trump remember when kanye west had an interview with i think wall street journal and he said that he was developing the perfect hoodie he was you know perfecting this perfect hoodie in his idea with the perfect hem sizes the perfect hood the perfect pouch pocket and he essentially wanted to first collaborate i'm assuming it was with walmart or costco that was the first sort of thing he wanted to do but now he's got the opportunity to provide that same perfect hoodie to the masses um using the outlet such as gap and then it finishes off that look with some khaki pants and i don't know if that's a shirt that's being thrown in there on the left of the screen but it looks in purple and lilac so immediately you see the color palette is completely different to what he's doing at yeezy there's a lot more bright colors there the tones are a bit more vibrant and obviously now going to the second announcement when you look at the team it makes a lot of sense right um he's essentially uh, put together a small team uh precisely for this kind of multi-year collaboration and he has uh got together with the likes of if it comes up here on the screen bu, 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 bu. oh that's a logo for yeezy and gap as well uh taking the iconic uh gap logo and flipping it with the yeezy symbol and then lastly he announced the lineup of who is actually going to be part of it. Let's go back to his Twitter profile actually here. Boom, get that back on the screen there. It's on here. But the team as well sort of reflects the vibrant nature of the collaboration. So it said Yeezy Gap begins, all caps. Uh, Mawala, so Mawala, Mawalola joins as Yeezy Gap um, Design Director. And if you're a fan of um, ex-CSM graduates or whatever it may be, definitely check out her work. She's got a really cool interview in Days, actually, a feature that I read a while back that was really good. Um, again, loads of bright colors, um, loads of interesting materials. So I'm interested to see what they're gonna be doing on the material front in terms of textures or whatever. Um, there's also announcements for the Kids See Ghost cartoon done by Murakami and Cuddy. There's going to be a Jesus is King film on Apple directed by James Terrell, it looks like. There's going to be a Yeezus Supply doc, documentary directed by Nick Knight. There's going to be a foam runner released and uh, made entirely in the US, which I'm really looking forward to. That foam runner looks amazing. It's my ideal sandal. Not really a fan of sandals. And then Jesus is King, um, Dr. Dre version is coming out, which is going to be impeccable. And the Wash Us In Your Blood video by Alpha Jaffa. So an incredible lineup of stuff that He's putting out sort of done it in like a tesla in like an elon musk tesla way you know very direct very to the point <clears throat> and then we have an article here from new york times essentially telling us what the actual crack is with the whole issue I'll quickly read that for you and then we'll head off but yeah i think it's good news man it's great to see kanye back um doing these kind of like mass collaborations you know touching people with his design uh prowess 
it, this platform I think is is amazing. So this is from New York Times. It says Kanye West and Gap strike a ten year deal for the Yeezy Gap apparel line. This is yeah, and it says here the Gap brand, which has uh, flared in recent years, has struggled with identity crisis, has a new idea for how to revive its fortunes. Kanye West, the retailer, is partnering with Mr. West and Yeezy, his fashion company, for a new clothing line called Yeezy Gap that will be introduced in the first half of 2021. The company said on Friday, um, Yeezy Design Studio under Mr. West's creative direction plans to create modern, elevated basics for men, women, and kids at accessible price points. Mr. West's design vision will extend to the, how the fashion line will be showcased in Gap stores online. That'd be amazing to see. So a complete overhaul, right, of how they present their uh, garments. And if you've been to Gap too, you know that they've got some pieces in there, but the way the store is merchandised is, oof, it makes you think you should never shop in there. But they've, they've actually got some pieces, honestly. Um, it continues. Um, Gap is making a far bigger bet on Mr. Yeezy and Mr. West, a celebrity, creative entrepreneur, rapper, and designer than a typical designer collaboration. They agreed a 10-year deal starting this month with the option to renew after five years. Of According to a person familiar with the negotiation who is not authorized to speak publicly, um, at the five-year point, Gap is hoping the Yeezy Gap will be generating one billion in annual sales, which is probably going to happen. Imagine seeing gaps at, imagine seeing queues outside of Gap around the world. Amazing, isn't it? The, the fucking power this guy has is incredible. Um, it says for context, Gap's brand bought in four point six billion globally in revenue, right? So imagine if he's able to surpass that just through his own little capsule collection. Um, Gap did not respond to requested a comment. <clears throat> It comes as Gap Inc., which also owns Old Navy and Banana Republic, aims to refocus its namesake brand, which has been which has seen sales plummet in the past few years, closed more than a hundred North American stores, and struggles to redefine its place within the apparel industry. It, like other brands, has also had a badly hit by coronavirus pandemic. Mr. West, who worked at Gap as a teen, which is incredible, you know way to kind of bring things around full circle has expressed deep interest in the brand for years declaring in a 2015 interview that he would like to be the Steve Jobs of the Gap and once dreamed of being the head creative director he has visited the San Francisco headquarters and met with Art Peck Gap's um, former chief executive the Gap deal will fulfill a desire of Mrs. West to make clothing for the masses even as Yeezy has become a, persist a presence in New York and Paris fashion weeks Yeezy merchandise on Farfetch recently included a $950 $925 graphic card and a $241 women's thermal sweater. At Gap, jeans and tops often cost less than $50 and are regularly discounted. Gap will pay royalties and potential equity to Mr. Yeezy. Wow, Miss West, sorry, which um, is solely owned by West based on sales and performance. Mr. West has successfully partnered with Adidas since 2013, where his brand has positioned as its own category and he earns royalties on net sales of his shoes and apparel, the New York Times reported last June. Each of shoes, which cost hundreds of dollars and even more on secondary market, were expected to top 1.3 billion sales last year. Mamma mia, man. Incredible, man. What a come up for Kanye. What an absolute come up. And again, I can't wait to see <clears throat> what that collection looks like. Um, so far, the one picture already gives me hope it's going to be absolutely banging. For sure. For sure, there's going to be Elves Court. But I guess with it being in Gap, it's going to be an option for us to all get a piece of it. Um, I'm, I'm excited. I can't wait to see what the future lies with in terms of Gap and Yeezy. So, I don't know. Watch this space, I guess. Keep an eye on the social medias. Someone will tell you. Someone will tell you. Anyway. That's your next video show, episode number 232. Thanks so much for tuning in. I'm going to go off and have a four-mile run now. Um, if you like what you're listening to, of course, smash that like button, hit subscribe. If you're listening via the podcast app, leave me a five-star review and share it with your friends. Um, if you want more information regarding myself, click the link below. You have to see a website. And if you want to follow me via Instagram, do that, agasonzinger.com. Follow me on Instagram, agasonzinger, all one word, sorry, agasonzinger, all one word on Instagram. And follow me on Twitter, agasonzinger, all one word on Twitter too. And I'll see you guys again next week. Until then, have a good weekend. Enjoy yourself. Don't get burnt outside. And if if you, you know, if you do get burned, I don't know, cover yourself in olive oil, whatever you do. Take care. Peace. Bye. See ya.